The Genius of Islam also received the top award for nonfiction from the Middle East Outreach Council. The Genius of Islam was published in Arabic in April 2012 by Dar al Ilm Bil Malayin in Beirut. So, um, Brin is a very gifted writer and a knowledgeable person, and as a matter of fact, I suggested to him to become an ambassador or a minister. He <laughs> said he would think about that. <laughs> so, this is the book that was translated in Arabic. For those of you who are learning Arabic, you may need to have a look at it. So, he will share his knowledge with us about uh, the genius of Islam. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Brin Bernard. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming this evening, um, and especially for my pals from AIS coming. Um, I, um, I had the good fortune when I was in high school to be an exchange student to Malaysia. I lived with a, a Muslim family uh, in a small village uh, not far from Singapore, living in a house on stilts uh, with a thatched roof, and a very devout Muslim family who were extremely kind to me uh, and, and really uh, any questions I had about, about their faith, they answered. And it got me very interested in Islamic uh, religion and the civilization. And uh, when I was in university, uh, whenever there was an opportunity to learn about Southeast Asia and Islam, I, I took it. Um, I ultimately was able to teach an art history class on, on uh, Islamic art. Uh, but my career has been as an illustrator and more recently as a writer and illustrator. And uh, the, the, uh, I've written books on diseases and on plagues. I've uh, illustrated books on dinosaurs and on space travel. Uh, but after 9-11, I um, put together a slideshow that I showed in my school district in uh, Washington State. I went around to the elementary school, the middle school, the high school, and our community college to talk about that experience that I'd had in Malaysia and what the, uh, the Muslims that I knew in Southeast Asia were like. And out of that slideshow, ultimately came this book uh, that I proposed to Random House, my publisher, uh, and they, they contacted librarians in the U.S. said, what do you think of a book for middle school kids about um, Islamic civilization and its impact on the West? That was my proposal. And librarians enthusiastically answered saying, there's nothing like this that we know of in, in, uh, in our libraries. Or, and it really, really fill a hole in the curriculum. And, uh, and if you look at a middle school curriculum in the United States, you know, so typically people that are in seventh and eighth grade, uh, the typically there might be one page uh, or two or three devoted to, to the Islamic world. And often what it says something is like this. It says, after the fall of Rome, uh, the classical Greek and Roman knowledge was preserved by the Arabs for a thousand years, handed back to the Europeans, and that's the end of the story. And they may, after maybe saying a little bit about you know the five pillars and so on and so forth, it's a very it's very limited uh, in in talk, and it almost sounds like Islam was something that existed once upon a time and isn't around anymore. And so I wanted to show how the story about uh, about the Islamic world and the Western world is a continuing interwoven one, and that's really what this book is about. It's it's not so much about the religion of Islam, but the civilization and the uh, the undeniable fact that, uh, that there's this continuing connection that up until a couple hundred years ago was, was understood and acknowledged um, throughout, throughout the West. Um, Europeans in the 12th and 13th and 14th centuries often uh, talked about their debt to, um, to Arab knowledge for, um, for their understanding of the world. Um, in the, for Islam's first 500 years, it was the preeminent scientific power uh, in, the, in the world rivaled pretty much only by, uh, by China. Um, and that, and that um, even, even long after sort of the tables turned and, and Europe sort of got back on its feet after the Middle Ages and started becoming more powerful, there was still a, a, this connection continued. So what my book does is talk about um, connections in science, in art, in philosophy, in technology, uh, in architecture. And I'm going to go through that now, and I, I'm going to try and, and uh, briefly give you sort of a timeline to sort of, for, the, I'm, for some of you this will be um, uh, stuff you already know, for others this may be new, new information, and, uh, and then I will sort of talk about different areas 
Um, and this is only meant to be an introduction. It's not meant to be comprehensive. Um, if you're interested, my book is for sale at Jarir Bookstore in both the English and the, um, in the Arabic editions. And there's a very extensive bibliography in the back. Uh, you could also um, order it off of my website from Amazon.com and uh, with connections there. And so this, this gives you um, lots of places to go um, if, you're, if you become more interested in the subject. So it's called The Genius of Islam and the subtitle is How Muslims Made the Modern World. I'm not suggesting that Muslims were the only people that made the modern world, but um, I think that too often um, Islamic uh, accomplishments and contributions haven't gotten enough uh, enough acknowledgement. And so, um, and I should, as I indicated, I'm an illustrator. And so every painting um, and map that you've seen here, I did myself. All the paintings are in oil. Um, and all the maps were done in Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop. And uh, of course, I wrote the book as well. Um, but it, it, um, a book is a, is a um, cooperative enterprise between an author and an editor. Um, and in my case, also an art director and a designer. And so all four of us working together created um, what you're seeing here. And so this timeline that I'm going to go through kind of quickly um, shows you uh, the, um, some, the influences that, there were, that, is, that Islam had and, and the world had in Islam. So before the advent of Islam in the 7th century, you have classical Egypt. Let's see, I guess I can use this. Classical Egypt. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Okay, classical Egypt, um, the founding of Rome in 763, classical Greece, the birth of Jesus, Islam of course being an Abrahamic religion with connections to Judaism and Christianity. Sassanid Persia is really important, classical India, and all these things you'll be hearing as I'm talking, I'll be re referring back to this. This is probably the crucial date, 476, the fall of Rome. The Romans where the Roman civilization was the organizing principle in the Mediterranean, provided law, provided, uh, provided technology, provided a sort of a philosophical organizing principle. With the fall of, of, the, of the Western Roman Empire, that changed. It created a political vacuum. And so um, with the rise of, the Islam, of, of Islam from Mecca, uh, uh, here in, in, in Arabia, first this is the area that be, became during the life of the, of the Prophet. Muhammad. Um, this is the area that, that became uh, Islamic. This area here is during the first four followers, the caliphs that followed him. And then this light green area takes us to uh, about 100 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. So um, the dates, of course, uh, that, that all Muslims know, 570, the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, in 613, he begins preaching the message of Islam. About that same time, the Tang Dynasty is rising in, ch in China. And so the connections between ch uh, Chinese civilization and Islamic civilization become very important. And you'll, and you'll see, I've already mentioned Persia, Rome, uh, 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 Greece. All of these other, other cultures uh, are things that, that add and, and connect um, with the Islamic world. Um, I'm going to be mentioning these two areas here, and if I seem like I'm, I'm running through this, the last time I gave this presentation here, I wasn't able to get to the end, and it was very frustrating for me, because the end is the, really the most, one of the most important parts of the story. So, um, you can read the book and get all the extra information. <laughs> so, the Umayyads in Spain, this was the first Islamic dynasty. So after the first four um, caliphs, or caliphs, um, first four rulers of Islam um, after, after the Prophet Muhammad, um, there was a, a long dynasty, the Umayyads. Um, they were based in Damascus, Syria. And the Abbasid revolution in 764 um, destroyed the Umayyad dynasty, but one survivor managed to get from Damascus here in Syria and go along North Africa and arrive in the, the fledgling Islamic civilization, southern Spain, and found the Western Umayyad dynasty. And the competition, socially, politically, economically, technologically, between the Western Umayyads in Spain and the Abbasids in their new capital of Baghdad fueled a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. That competition, a fashion that would start in in Damascus would be very quickly transmitted to Cordoba, the capital of the Western Umayyads. Um, a new idea, say, about astronomy that, st that would start here in Cordoba would be transmitted back, back here. Fashion, music, hairstyles, back and forth, back and forth. 
The other thing that caused the transmission of ideas was, of course, the Hajj, the pilgrimage that all Muslims have to make at, um, if they can afford it at some time in their life to Mecca. So not only would people perform the religious rituals, but, at, but they would say, oh, what's going on in, say, out here? Well, we just learned about this new thing called paper. How do you make that? And then you go back to Spain and tell them, guess what I just learned in Mecca? I learned how to make paper. And so you could, this was like the World Wide Web of its day. People would come, they would exchange ideas and transmit them throughout the growing Islamic empire. So then um, in, the, in, the, in the beginning you get conquest of these areas. Why? I already mentioned the fall of the Western Roman Empire, this big political vacuum in this area. But the Eastern Roman Empire continued and they, f they fought with Persia. And by the time um, Islam began to rise out of Arabia, these two were pretty much on their last legs. Um, B the Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire survived, but Sassanid Persia collapsed. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the um, Islamic, Islamic civilization spread into the footprint of what had been um, the Eastern Roman Empire in Persia and absorb their cultures. And you start seeing the influences of their cultures in Islamic art and architecture and so on. So then going east uh, through India and China, most of, most of the um, spread of, of Islam there is through trade. And so by about 1500, this is the footprint of the Islamic world. So here it is basically around the Mediterranean basin and, and the Arabian Peninsula. But by 1500, you have pretty much the footprint that you have today. From just below Spain, you notice that here for 500 years, Islamic rule. But this is reconquered by, um, by Christendom uh, by 1492. But then this whole area has become, has become Muslim all the way down to the Philippines. And that's more or less the footprint today. But by about 1600, um, Europe, which for most of the beginning of the Islamic of world, like I said, with the collapse of Rome, you lose that organizing principle. You have what in Europe is called uh, uh, sometimes the Dark Ages, sometimes the Middle Ages. Um, Europe gets back on its feet um, with the Renaissance, which ironically is catalyzed by Europe's uh, rediscovery of their classical roots thanks to Islamic civilization, which I'll be talking about shortly. And with that renaissance comes a rise in, in uh, European political power and cultural power, and eventually the conquest of virtually every country uh, of, or area of the, Muslim, of the Muslim world by European powers, that col colonization. So just to back up here, here we have that footprint um, about one century after um, the death of the Prophet Muhammad, and here we have it um, by the year 1500. So now I'm going to start on my um, journey through different areas of um, the wonders of Islamic civilization. So the, the, um, Islam is unique in that um, uh, rather the, the, the revelation that the Prophet Muhammad received from, the angel, uh, from God through the angel Gabriel um, comes in the form of words. So words and writing are more important in Islam than just about any other religion pot with the possible exception of Judaism. And those words are written down. So writing takes a preeminent form. Uh, cool. and, the, and the stretching and squashing and, and evolution of calligraphy the, um, is unprecedented in, in its, uh, in its uh, many different forms and beauty uh, that you find in, in Islam. So here we have, and the Quran becomes that first book. So writing, words, language become hugely important. How do you make copies of those books? Well, remember, this is, this is a long time ago, long before the printing press, when all books are pretty much written out by hand. So if you've ever seen a picture of a Christian monk in, a, in his little cell, and he's sitting at his table, and there's a little beam of light coming in from a window, and he's scratching away, and he has one copy of a Bible over here, and he's working on one piece of parchment, and a year later, he finishes one book. Well, uh, Muslims came up with a, a pretty innovative method of doing something different one person would recite the book because oral recitation was a, a long-standing tradition before the advent of Islam and it continued after uh, the advent of Islam, people reciting um, orally their books. And then you would have scribes who would sit around and they would copy what the person said. So one person, 10 scribes, 10 copies. One reciter, 20 scribes, 20 copies. 100 scribes, 100 copies in one session. And this was a unique way of creating multiple copies of, of books. So you get um, the Islamic world having a big advantage in the transmission of information by this way of creating lots and lots and lots of books. 
And uh, when we get to my next era, you'll see how they managed to do that in an inexpensive way. So writing evolves very quickly, starting with Kufic, which came out of stone inscriptions, quickly switched to the um, reed pen like Nasq and Tuluth and Diwani. Um, and then also, um, the, as I said, calligraphy becomes the preeminent form of artistic expression in Islam. Um, although uh, in, sec in sacred spaces, it, it becomes the, really the only form besides geometric and, and vegetative design with no figures. But outside of the um, outside of secular spaces, you find figurative work. But zoomorphic calligraphy is a way of sort of doing a figure, but doing it with words. And so here you have a peacock um, with bismillah. And then here is lithographic reproduction. Why do I show that? Well, sometimes Muslims have been criticized um, because uh, when Gutenberg invented his printing press, um, it didn't catch on in the Muslim world. Well, if you've ever seen one of those Gutenberg printing presses, you have single individual wooden blocks which don't lend themselves very well to this very um, um, elastic kind of writing that was developed out of Arab script. So um, lith lithography, if you're not familiar with it, you have a special kind of stone, you write on it with a grease pencil, you flood it with water, and then you roll a, um, a, a oil-based ink on top of that, which sticks to the grease pencil, but is rejected by the water. Put a piece of paper on that, roll over it, one copy, ink it again, two copies, three copies, four copies. So this lends itself to drawing um, pictures, but also it lends itself very well to writing. And so a lot of books that were reproduced in copies um, in, in the Islamic world, within 10 years of the invention of lithography in Germany, it had spread throughout the Islamic world, um, um, really surpassing um, the, the spreading of the, of the Gutenberg printing press. Um, in fact, up until the 20th century, there were newspapers in India and Pakistan that were still being produced using this, this lithographic method. You're probably familiar with these letters, the letter I and the letter J. Now, does anybody, um, you get special points for this, notice anything similar between these letters and these letters? Anybody? These letters and these letters. <laughs> dots. dots, good, gold star. Okay, um, so where did those dots, why do we have dots here and dots here? Well, uppercase um, Latin letters come from Rome, the Roman civilization. Lowercase Roman letters, they're not from, there were, there were no lowercase Roman letters. Um, that comes from Carolinian, which was something that was developed in the Middle Ages um, during the reign of Charlemagne. There's no dots in those letters. So the thinking among scholars of writing is that as trade started to pick up during the late Middle Ages between the Islamic world and the European world, a lot of those trade goods had writing on it. And some European genius said, hey, look, they've got these dot things on their writing that we can't read. We could use those on these letters so we can tell the difference between these two letters and all the other letters that look just like them. And so there's no definitive, there's no person who wrote his treatise on dots about the I and the J, but there's a time when they're not there, and then there's trade with the Islamic world, and then they appear. So that's one of the suggestions about, about um, why we have dots on our lowercase I and J. So next time you dot your I's and J's, thank Islamic civilization. <laughs> Paper. So I said, how do they make all those books? Well, with the spread of Islam east to China, um, paper was invented in China in the second century, and the Tang Dynasty spread that into Central Asia, and Islam spread east, Tang Dynasty spread west, they met, um, there was a battle, there was uh, some uh, capture of prisoners, some of whom it's thought, this is the way the story goes, were paper makers, and almost immediately paper technology was transmitted from China. Now in China they use mulberry bark. Uh, mulberry doesn't grow very well in Central Asia, so in Central Asia they decided to use uh, linen, which comes from flax, which does grow there. So uh, instead of mushing up mulberry leaves, they mushed up flax and put it on a screen uh, and let it dry and you got paper. And that's pretty much the way paper is made today, whether you use cotton or paper pulp. You take the stuff, you mush it up with water, you let it dry in a screen, sometimes squish it out, and that's, that's pretty much paper. But um, this took off in the Muslim world. And so you have this way of making lots of books by having all the reciters. Now you have a cheap, inexpensive way of making paper. Let me just give you an example. If um, 
parchment, which was the way most people were either writing on parchment or papyrus in the Middle East. Parchment was so expensive and so valuable, often when someone was done writing something and everyone was done reading it, they would scrape off the parchment and reuse it. And so you can actually see pieces of parchment that have a palimpsest of the old um, letters um, show, showing through. It was very, very expensive. Paper, you could use it, you could throw it away, it was, it was not as not that valuable. Um, but paper, um, paper technology really took off. So, and something else took off too. The Chinese, uh, the Asians, and also the Greeks had this, the, the roll, which is you take a piece of long paper, you roll it, you write on it, you roll it up, and you can store it in a little, in a little cubby. And there was something else they, they used called the codex, which we know as the book. And the bureaucrats in the Abbasid Empire in Baghdad preferred the codex to the roll. It was easier to stack, easier to find information, and an edict came out from the Abbasid, um, the vizier, uh, during the, I can't remember the reign of which caliph, but he said that this is going to be what we're going to be doing all of our um, keeping of records in. So, and if you have books with you today, you can thank the Abbasid Empire for that. Um, and not only, and also they decreed that we're not going to be using parchment, and we're not going to be using papyrus, we're going to be using paper. And that, so it was official edicts coming from the most powerful civilization in the Mediterranean basin, the, the Abbasids, that really helped spread paper technology and book technology throughout the world, throughout that part of the world. Also, they, they decreed certain paper sizes. You may wonder why when you uh, write an A4 size paper, who came up with that paper size? Well, that is the distant, um, distant descendant of the paper sizes that were also decreed by the Abbasids. This paper size for this function, this paper size for this function, this paper weight, this paper color. They had very specific colors and sizes for all different functions of the Islamic bureaucracy. So we have the roll, we have the codex and we have the library. That's wasn't an, that was not an invention of Muslims. There was this, when uh, Islam spread out of Arabia and encountered the great library at Alexandria, um, they, this was a way of, of keeping, keeping things, um, keeping information. Uh, notice one difference between probably uh, any library that you've encountered um, in, modern, in the modern world and this library. Anybody have any suggestions? The way they're keeping the books? on their sides, right. Now I've talked to librarians who say this is an excellent way of pre preserving the spines. So apparently um, that medieval Muslims had, a, had something over on us moderns. Um, but you notice they have these little tags hanging here and that was something that was transmitted from those paper rolls before some, some smarty pants got the idea of actually writing the names of uh, things on the edges of the spines. And that's something that also started happening in the Muslim world. So when you see titles on the edges of spines, that's something that started in the Islamic world as well. Um, of course, once you have all this paper technology, um, you start getting people uh, trying to come up with the biggest and the best and the Guinness books, things like this. This is this giant Quran that was created, um, was commissioned by Tamerlane, uh, uh, t uh, who was the, um, one of the conquerors of Central Asia. And he uh, commissioned this Quran, uh, which in my painting here, this is in the, um, in the, uh, the, uh, the mosque in Samarkand. And if you go to the British Museum, you can see um, this particular page uh, in the British Museum in London. Six feet tall, two meters tall. Um, also, I mentioned those different weights of paper. Here we have bird paper, which was the email of its day. So we always have the World Wide Web of its day, and now we have the email of its day. And this was very thin light paper that you could write um, messages on and put in a little backpack on a pigeon and send that pigeon off to the Sultan could find out what was going on in various parts of his domain. Translation. The Great Translation Project was the Human Genome Project of its day. Everyone's heard of Aristotle. He's considered the founder of Western civilization. Well, in my painting of Aristotle here, he has all these cracks on his face and these different colors. What I'm trying to suggest in this illustration is that the Aristotle we know is not really one person. He's a composite personality made up of Muslim translator after Muslim translator after Muslim translator because there is no original Greek Aristotle extant in the world today. The oldest Aristotle that we have today is in Arabic. It's an Arabic translation with commentaries, and that's not even the earliest. It's, a, it's seen, it was a translation 
with commentaries from an earlier version, from an earlier version, from an earlier version. So when we look at Aristotle today, we're really seeing him through a multitude of Muslim lenses as they tried to figure out what he was saying and comment on it and stretch it and squash it and take it from the original Greek into Syriac and from Syriac into Arabic. Uh, Muslims encountered Aristotle in that great library at Alexandria. And um, they noticed that there were um, the Greek philosophers that were, that were being stored in that one library um, were saying things that seemed like things that were being said in the Quran. And so there was this idea that if we, tra if that Muslims, if they translated all the ancient Greek knowledge, it would, it would, it would buttress, back up, show um, the, um, that the ancients, that a lot of the knowledge in the Quran was connected to the ancient world and, and was, this was like universal knowledge that, had, that was, was the, that the, um, the, 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 what the ancients knew was also being re was revealed in the, in the Quran as well. Um, this, this project uh, really got underway during the Abbasid Empire. And um, it was they, the idea was to translate everything from the ancient Greek world, to take all of ancient knowledge and turn it into Arabic, plus all the knowledge of ancient Babylon, plus all the knowledge of Persia, plus all the knowledge of China, plus all the knowledge of India, everything that, uh, that uh, Muslims gave their hands on for one century in the place called the Beit al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom in, in Baghdad. You would bring in manuscripts. Whoops, let's go backwards there, sorry. Got a little ahead of myself. Okay, um, you you would bring in manuscripts, and they would be read, uh, and then they would be uh, they'd be translated into Arabic, and they'd be turned from the rolls into these codexes here. So this is my suggestion of what the Beit Al Hikma looked like. If you were a translator in those days, this was a great gig to have. Um, you were worth your weight, literally worth your weight in gold. The best translators would stand on a scale, and they would be gold would be piled up on the other side, and that was their payment for the year. And and the great the great men of, of Baghdad would compete to get the favor and the you know they try to get commissions of the greatest translators and get them to work for them. No, I want you to work for me. I'll pay you more. That sort of thing. And then 500 years later, in in Spain, during the what's called the the Convivencia, which was when. Christians, Jews, and Muslims were living in relative harmony in Spain. And this is also during the Reconquista, as, the, as Christians are slowly reconquering the Muslim parts of Spain. There was an effort by one of the uh, Christian kings in Toledo to, um, to translate all of this, this knowledge um, that had been translated from Arabic into Latin. And it's this retranslation project here that really kickstarts the Renaissance. There are really three points of contact between the Muslim world and the Western world. One of them is in Sicily, one of them is in, in Constantinople, which became Istanbul. But one of the really most important points, because of that competition between um, the Umayyads, uh, the Western Umayyads, and the Abbasids, is in Spain. And really, a lot of the books that get translated, they, the, you, can, you can see directly uh, as, uh, discoveries in astronomy that happen in Europe right after a book gets translated from, from Arabic into, into Latin. Uh, discoveries in, in uh, lens making, discoveries in mathematics. Every time these books start getting translated, you see leaps in European understanding. And often Europeans sometimes actually claiming the books for themselves. There was a great sort of cottage industry of going down to Spain and finding a book on, say, the astrolabe and translating it into Latin and saying, look what I discovered. So um, this, was a, um, this was something that, that occurred during the, the sort of the beginnings of the Renaissance. And really, um, it's my contention that this is what really lit the fire of the Renaissance. Europeans were ready for it, um, but they, once their knowledge of the ancient Greek world, plus a thousand years of Muslim um, building on that foundation, is really what, what, what got things going. Mathematics. Um, mathematics is probably one of the areas where uh, that the, the Muslim contribution to, to modern mathematics is, is, is most acknowledged. Now, if you, anyone wearing an analog watch, if you've ever wondered why it has 12 hours rather than 10, and why we have 60 seconds rather than 100, that's because it's a sexadecimal counting, and that's something we inherited from the ancient Babylonians. That's why we have 360 degrees in a circle. And that was one of the counting systems that was being used at the time of the advent of Islam. I mentioned that ancient Roman Empire. I'm sure you all learned your Roman numerals in school with V for five and I for one and X for, for 10, which is great for addition and subtraction and multiplication and division, a little bit harder. Higher math, 
pretty much Im impossible. Am I right, Mary Jo? Is that true? <laughs> that is the head of our math department from AIS. And um, so that's notational counting. Um, but, uh, but the kind of counting that um, came out of um, ancient India is called decimal counting, base 10, which we're familiar with. And so uh, this, these are what are called Brahmi numerals right up here. And if any of you know Chinese, you'll notice that these look a lot like the Chinese 1, 2, 3. These spread west and they also spread east, influencing uh, counting systems throughout the world. And so here you have the, uh, the Brahmi numerals. Um, that's about the first century AD. And then these are Hindu numerals in about the fifth century AD. If you notice something different between these, there's only nine of them. And by the fifth century, um, Hindus have come up with the concept of zero. And that concept of zero plus that decimal system gets transmitted to Arabia and from Arabia throughout the Islamic empire. Um, and it outcompetes the other counting systems. It outcompetes the Roman numeral system and the sexadecimal system, system and some of the others. And it becomes the dominant counting system in the Muslim world. And eventually the Europeans um, catch on. In fact, um, Fibonacci, who um, is famous for his Fibonacci sequence, he's an Italian, he goes across to North Africa and he notices how e much more efficient the counting houses and the accountants in North Africa are than the ones back in Italy. And so he writes a book um, about um, this new kind of math and brings it back and it takes off in the banking system uh, in Europe. So you have Eastern Arabic numerals, Western Arabic numerals, and then Byzantine numerals, and notice how they're getting closer and closer. Notice how some of them, they, they change direction. There's the three looking kind of like our three, then it changes that way and then gets this way, and eventually we get to the modern three. Um, so um, you can, it, we often call them Arabic numerals, but more, more properly they're called Hindu Arabic numerals. So if you've ever taken um, two, um, a two-place number and stacked it over another two-place number and put a line under it and either um, added or subtracted or multiplied, um, someone had to invent that. And the person who invented that was a mathematician named al Uqladisi as a way of adding, subtracting, and multiplying. So you're doing something that was invented by a medieval Arabic mathematician. And then this is probably the most famous of all Arab mathematicians, Muhammad al-Musa al-Khwarizmi. And his name in the Latin translation of his most famous book was Logarithmi, and a portion of the title of that book was Al-Zabr, and if any of you have suffered through algebra in school, you'll know that that comes from this Arabic word, and if you've ever tried to learn your logarithms, it's thanks to his name. Art, my favorite subject. I've already talked about calligraphy and its importance in Islam, geometry. Um, uh, all of those discoveries in math got Muslims very interested in geometry. Um, the arabesque, bec um, the, the showing of, of the natural world through, through um, decorative versions of, of plant life also became one of the, one of the ways that, that Muslims like to decorate spaces. And one of the nice things about all three of these is that they're infinitely repeatable. So you can cover any space and they're squashable and stretchable. So you can move them around just about any three-dimensional space. And um, I've already mentioned zoomorphic calligraphy. And I, I mentioned briefly pictorial representation. As I said that in sacred spaces, pretty much forbidden, but in secular spaces, very, very common. And so you get a great tradition of, uh, of Muslim um, books, uh, secular books, Persian miniatures, Turkish miniatures, Indian miniatures, with really brilliant figurative illustrations, some of which are really incomparable. So this, this calligraphy and geometry and the arabesque get put on textiles, and they get put on glass, and they get put on metalwork, and they get put on beautiful architectural um, gems like the Alhambra. Um, and this is my version of the, uh, well, the court of the, one of the interior, um, Courts of the Court of the Lions, and here you have, uh, down here you have geometry, and here you have calligraphy, and here you have the arabesque all together. I visited this recently and it didn't look anything like this because there were about five billion tourists in there. <laughs> so, part two. So we're going to go move forward here. Architecture. That was so you could have your break and your coffee and all that stuff. So, so the Grand Mosque in Damascus, as Islam spread um, into uh, what had been the Roman world, they encountered this, which was the rounded arch. 
So the Romans came up with the dome and the drum and the column, which some of which they'd inherited from previous civilizations, but use that. If you look at Roman architecture, they have dome buildings and they have columns and they have arches. What's the point of an arch? Well, if you have a big wall and you want to punch a window in it, you can do what we do over here, which is a lintel, which just basically takes all the weight of what's coming down and, and holding it with a, with a mass. Whoops, sorry. Okay, I just get too excited with this pointer. Okay. Okay, so um, that lintel up there takes the mass of the wall. Um, but the nice thing about a dome is, uh, uh, sorry, a, an arch, is that all this weight here gets pushed to the side like that. Okay, and so, and it goes down. So it gets pushed out and down. Well, the, one of the disadvantages of that is you can only make walls so high. But um, this is an, 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 a, uh, an Assyrian invention called the pointed arch. You can barely see the point here, but that's on the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and then you can also see it here on the Ibn Tulun Mosque, here. My thumb is too big, that's the problem with this. Um, where it's, the points are more obvious, and you can see it here on the Taj Mahal. And the nice thing about a pointed arch is that it takes the weight more down than out. And so you can get higher and higher and higher. And Muslims also came up with other kinds of, of, uh, of architectural forms like the horseshoe arch, and the OG arch, and the multifoil arch. And, uh, and that, this pointed arch here gets transmitted from the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem to the Ibn Tulun Mosque in Cairo, across North Africa, jumps to Italy, finds its way up to France, till eventually at what's considered the first Gothic building on earth, the Cathedral of Saint-Denis in Paris, you have pointed arches. And Christopher Wren, one of the great um, architects of the Neo-Gothic period, in his writing about architecture, he says uh, at several points that Gothic architecture is the architecture of the Saracens, which was one of the European words for Muslims. And he, he, and he uses rounded arches and pointed arches and something that looks an awful lot like a minaret in his building of a Tim's Tower in Oxford. Astronomy, which you've already seen, but I'll... <laughs> um, this is the astrolabe, which is the GPS device of its day. So we have the World Wide Web, we have email, we have GPS. Um, the medieval world was a lot like our world. Um, so the astrolabe is a, is a Greek invention. Um, the astrolabe is a compound um, um, Arab Greek word. And if you had one of these, you could figure out where you were in the world. And so a civilization that knows where they are has advantages over all the others who don't. And so with this astrolabe, you could, this was a map of the stars in the sky. And so if you knew where you were latitudinally, oh, I'm in Cairo, so I'll put in the Cairo plate on the back of this. Damascus, I'll put the Damascus plate. So that would tell you where you were latitudinally. And then you point this at the, at the sky, and you look at the stars, you go, aha, this tells me where I am longitudinally. So, no, so that you could figure out where you were on a map. And many different versions of these astrolabes uh, were used to determine the direction of Mecca, the height of building, the size of land. It had many, many, many different uses. Um, it was also used at sea to figure out mariners who knew where they were in the ocean had advantages over mariners who didn't. Um, spherical astrolabes gave you sort of a three-dimensional version of the sky. Um, the, the Safiha was invented in Spain, and this was a universal astrolabe that didn't, um, didn't need the plates. So you, this, you could be anywhere um, in the equatorial, uh, the equatorial world from about the, um, the Sahel in Africa up to the middle of Europe, and this would work telling you what the sky looked like. So this is an invention of the um, Western Umayyad Empire. So what's something else you can do? You can measure the Earth with an astrolabe. And this is how it was done coming out of Baghdad in the 9th century AD with rope, sticks, and an astrolabe. So a, an expedition was sent out by the ruler of Baghdad, and he said, I want to find out how, how round the world is. And so um, the, the, this expedition, they had an astrolabe here, and they walked one degree of latitude from Baghdad out into the desert. So they were looking at the stars until they know they'd walked one degree, and they were stretching this rope behind them and holding it straight with sticks. And then they measured that distance, and then they multiplied it using that Babylonian sexadecimal system times 360, and they got a circumference of the Earth that was only about 500 miles off. Not bad for sticks and rope and an astrolabe in the ninth century. And also star charts. If you've ever seen a star chart or if you've ever read your horoscope and seen those pictures of Cancer and Sagittarius and all that, the very earliest star charts, um, most of which came out of Persia, um, they used pictures as a sort of mnemonic device 
a visual device so you could organize all those stars and remember, ah, oh, that's where Sagittarius is, that's where Orion is. And so that's a, that's a device that got transmitted to Europe and the Europeans, they would just trade the turban for a little European hat with a feather on it. And, and that, would, that was a device that we still use today. Open up a newspaper, look at the, at the astrological section and they always have those same pictures. Medicine. Um, when uh, when the uh, armies of the Arab world um, moved into Persia with the fall of the Sassanid Empire, they, they discovered this thing called Bimaristan, the house of the ill. So this was a Persian invention which Muslims took and built on. And the Bimaristan spread throughout the Muslim world. We know them today as hospitals. Um, that's a European word for the same thing, but this was a new invention. You know, you're, you're sick, you go to a doctor. When you're really sick, you go to a hospital. In the old days, people didn't do that. They might go to a, uh, they might go to, to a shaman or they might have someone come to their house so they might just, just uh, wait to die. But they could go to a, a hospital where you had specialists some specialists for men, some specialists for women, um, wings for men, wings for women, bone setters, blood specialists, optical specialists. The uh, Muslims were the most advanced optical specialists on earth. In fact, all the parts of the eye that we, that we know today, the retina and the cornea, um, those are all Latin translations of the Arabic words um, that, were, that were invented um, with all the dissections of eyes that were done uh, in, this, in this medical world. So um, also the Muslim charts, the charts that were invented in the Muslim world um, were, were the most advanced and they were heavily sought after in Europe. This book by Avicenna, who's one of the great, uh, one of the great um, uh, Muslim uh, philosophers and mathematicians and also physicians, Al-Kanun Fi Al-Tib, the law of medicine. Up until the 19th century, any European doctor worth his salt made sure he had a Latin translation of this on his bookshelves. Um, because this was considered the, the definitive work on all of the knowledge up, um, from the ancient Greeks to the modern times. So, um, I've also mentioned, I've already mentioned eyes and, and, and the importance of, of uh, the parts of the eye. Optics became really, really important. The ancient Greeks had this idea that you would look at something and you would see it at the thing. So if I was looking at the projector, I would actually have a sight beam come out of my eye and look at the projector and I would see it at the projector. But Aristotle had this other idea Let's go back. Come on, Aristotle. Come on. There. Um, had this other idea that light would come and bounce off something and go into your eye. And there was a great Muslim um, philosopher, mathematician, and um, a, a, a optical theorist named Al-Haytham. There's a crater on the moon named after him. And he came up with the idea of how to produce an experiment that proved um, this idea of Aristotle's. And his ideas, written in his book Optics, translated into Latin, became the taking off point for this huge revolution in lenses, which completely transformed um, uh, European painting. You see this real change in European painting from very symbolic to very realistic and representational. It would have been p impossible without Al Haytham's theories. And of course, if any of you like me wear glasses, that would have been impossible without Al Haytham. They have used a telescope, a Xerox machine, um, microscope, um, all of those, uh, probably most of the camera phones you have, um, thanks to him. Agronomy. All of these foods you're probably familiar with, they all started out, except for one, in India. They're tropical foods that were really popular in the Arabian Peninsula, traded back and forth between India and the Arabian Peninsula, and they um, spread with Islam throughout the Mediterranean world. So I won't... Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them here, but we have sugarcane and rice and bananas and mangoes and plantains, watermelons and coconuts and artichokes and lemons and limes and oranges and eggplant and cotton and only coffee. Coffee came from Africa, but all these others came from India, spread, through the spread via Islam through the Mediterranean world and from the Mediterranean with Columbus to the New World and around the world. Um, the Noria wheel, water, water technology became really advanced in the Muslim world because you had to take all of these tropical foods and grow them in a desert climate, so you had to move water around. Um, they, some, of, some of this technology got transmitted to the New World. You can go to parts of the Yucatan today and still see 9th century Syrian uh, water technology being used in parts of the Yucatan Peninsula, like the Sakya and the Sanduk. Um, engineering, this is my favorite chapter, and those of you that are starting to get a little sleepy, we're almost at the end here. So I've already mentioned the Noria wheel and the Sakya. So this steam engine here, let me back up, the crank and the rod, this is one of the, this is considered 
the second most important invention in human engineering history after the wheel and it's uh, it's pretty much undeniably uh, an invention of the Islamic world. In the 12th century, there's a book by the Muslim engineer Al-Jazari, and it's the Book of Ingenious Inventions. It has 50 inventions in it, combination lock, plywood, um, certain kinds of standardized weights and measures. But he mentions this crank and rod, and he was using it to raise water, using those, that, those big Noria wheels like here to raise water. You'd turn this wheel round and round, and it would make something go up and down. You would turn circular motion to linear motion. This is my favorite chapter because I had to do this like five times for my editor who said, I don't understand what you're talking about. I do not understand what you're talking about. So I finally had to redo it and redo it and redo it, and finally with this illustration he goes, oh now I know what you're talking about. And so this is some bright European got the idea, wait, if you can make a wheel to make something go up back and forth, what happens if we make something go back and forth, turn a wheel? And from that idea you get um, the cars that you probably all drove in today with their crankshafts. Um, so the crankshaft is the, is the descendant of this invention that Al-Jazari brings to the attention of the world. Once his book is published, gets translated into Latin, you start seeing crank and rods all through Europe, and then you start getting things like the steam engine and the, and the propeller-driven uh, boats and airplanes and so on and so forth. And you get something like the carousel, so where you're, you're getting circular motion going up and down motion. And you get things like the walking beam oil derrick, very useful, um, where you can get circular motion creating up and down motion. And you can get there, we have the piston and cylinder, where you can get circular motion being created by up and down motion from the piston. And another one of Al Jazari's inventions up here, the cam, which are also used in the internal combustion engine. And there you have a big old internal combustion engine working away. Music. Um, these are musical instruments that were brought from the Islamic world to Europe by crusaders who came to retake the Holy Land and brought back things like sugarcane and coffee and the book and the nafir and the tabal and the uh, nakara, which were, became the basis for the, what became the European orchestra. Virtually everything in the European orchestra, ex with the exception of the harp, has its antecedent.